Welcome back to the show, guys. Today's topic is, well, it's near and dear to my heart because what it is about really, it's about how do we stay vital and strong and mobile through the decades. This is about, this is the Uber longevity um, episode or one of them anyway. And this is one of the pieces that is actually very foundational. It's not a peptide, it's not a bioregulator, but it is one of the most basic components of how we keep our bodies healthy and strong. And we're talking about protein and we're talking about how do we get enough quality protein in our diets so that we can keep this ship afloat and not just afloat, but really in good shape. My guest is a total expert in this and so many other areas of functional and integrative medicine. His name is Dr. David Minkoff, and he joins me today to talk about perfect aminos, which is, and and so much more really, but perfect aminos is really what it boils down to because those essential amino acids are such a critical piece of any athlete's protocol. They are a critical piece of you of your protocol, whether you are super healthy and a performance athlete, or whether you are struggling with your health and needing to get those components into your body in a way that your body can take. So I don't want to give it all away. Dr. Minkoff um, spent some time with me. We had a great conversation. I really hope you enjoy it as much as I did. If you're looking to connect with him, and of course, he sees patients from all over the world at his clinic in Florida, you can find him at lifeworkswellnesscenter.com. And their Instagram account is also lifeworkswellness as well. And if you're deciding that you want to get your hands on some of those perfect aminos, whether you get one of the great powdered drinks or you get the capsules, then you're going to want to go to bodyhealth.com. Use the link in the show notes because that'll take you to a page where you should actually get 20% off. And if you don't see 20% off there, you can just use discount code NAT20 at bodyhealth.com and that will save you 20% off your whole purchase. So thank you so much for being here. I a hundred percent appreciate you guys. You know, I do. If you're looking to connect with me, then you can find me on through my website, natnidham.com. That's where you can learn about BSP community, which is the mighty networks community. I launched just a few months ago. We've got so much amazing stuff going in there. We had live Q and a experts in December. We had one with Caleb Greer, uh, from episode 128, I think it was, or 129. In January, we had another one with Dr. Diane Goodenow uh, from Prodrome Sciences. All of those live Q&As are recorded and available for people to watch after the fact. I do live Q&As. We do peptide deep dives. So much fun stuff in there. So that's the BSP community. Otherwise, there's the Optimizing Superhuman Performance Group on Facebook. You can always find me there as well. So if you're enjoying this episode and you get lots of value from it, then I would ask you for two favors. One, please leave us a review because those are the things that help us to be found and helps this show to float to the top of the heap. And number two, share it with your friends. Share it with someone you know who will get value from this. And I will tell you, this episode in particular is relevant to pretty much anybody, whether they're vegan or carnivore or keto, whatever, whether they're young or old, an athlete, anybody, this episode is relevant to everyone. So I appreciate, appreciate you guys. You know I do. I tell you all the time. And I'm never going to stop telling you because I am so grateful for you being here and um, spending this time with me. Enjoy. Hey, folks. Just a quick reminder that all of the information presented in this podcast is for information purposes only. No medical advice, no diagnosing, no treatments suggested here. Before you try anything that you hear about or learn about here, make sure that you check with your medical provider. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Minkoff. It is such a pleasure and an honor to have you here today. Thank you, Natalie. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, no, I'm, I've been looking forward to this conversation. I think, I think we had one planned a while ago and something came up in my world. I had to cancel at the last minute. And so it's taken all this time, but here we are today. Um, so I'm really... You know, you're having someone on like you on the podcast is it's a little bit like being at a giant buffet, right? You're kind of like, there's so much we could talk about. <laughs> and in order not to appear to the audience, like I've got some kind of attention deficit disorder, I think that, you know, as we talked about before coming on, we're going to pick two topics. We're going to talk about those. And then if there's more that we want to talk about at another time, 
we'll record another episode <laughs> if, if if we have an, a good enough time here that you decide to come back. So I think the topic we decided on for today was Lyme. And so, but before we we dig dive into that directly, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about you. I mean, you're a big name in the space. You've got a big, beautiful clinic. You do lots of really interesting things. Um, and you're definitely on this mission to help people and help them to take control of their health. So with that, I'm turning it over to you, sir. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I did traditional medicine. I was a did a pediatric residency. I was chief resident at UC, Cal, UC San Diego. I did an infectious disease fellowship. I worked in infectious disease research with antiviral drugs. Uh, I was director of a neonatal intensive care unit. Um, I was uh, infection control officer at a big community hospital right at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. So we had all these people in the hospital with weird infections and nobody knew exactly what was going on. So I was in the middle of that. It was, it was, it was, you know, from an infectious disease standpoint, it was very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then about 10 years into that, I switched careers and I, I liked acute care. And I started doing emergency medicine, um, did trauma emergency medicine, and then hospital community me emergency medicine. And then my wife, who's a nurse and a very, very good triathlete, got ill. And mm -hmm. um, she started going to see Jeff Bland and other people to learn about what could be wrong with her. And she kind of dragged me along. <laughs> Kicking <laughs> and screaming at first? Or <laughs> were you a willing <laughs> participant? <laughs> Uh, I always loved learning um, and I wasn't sure I wanted to go to Orlando to do it, but she dragged me to Orlando. And then if you've ever seen or met Jeff Bland or heard him lecture, he's really the guy who coined the term functional medicine. Mm -hmm. He's a brilliant man. And um, boy, an hour into it on a, you know, a, an eight hours, two days in a row, because he could talk forever. <laughs> Uh, literally photographic memory, knew every reference he'd ever read, what page, what the quote was, just brilliant, man. Wow. Um, and I got hooked. I just got hooked and it was so interesting. And uh, the things, and then we started going around looking like who else knows a lot of stuff. And we got sort of hooked up into this network. And now it's more or less organized or there's organizations or societies that help doctors or health pra uh, care practitioners learn stuff. But back mm -hmm. then it was just like, you know, who knows what and, you know, talk to people. And we went all over the place to learn all kinds of stuff. And then I, so part of that un, unwound her condition, which she was mercury toxic okay. after bad dental experience. Um, and then people started, so I'm still working in emergency medicine. And people started to call me and say, you know, I saw Sue and she got better and I've got rheumatoid arthritis, chronic migraine headaches, ulcerative colitis, you know, um, chronic fatigue syndrome, blah, blah, blah. Can you help me? And I uh, like, I don't know, but um, her, she is, she owns a home healthcare nursing business and there was an extra room. And so I said, well, Tuesday afternoon and I'm off and I'll be over there. And do you want to come over? We can play. And I wasn't charging anybody because I wasn't sure I knew what I was doing. I had a success of kind of one. Um, and, and, but it exploded because what bet. I had was good stuff. And within about six months, um, I decided to transition out of the emergency room. And um, we renovated a 3,000 square foot space, got a nurse practitioner and started seeing people, so learn how to do chelation, set up an IV room. Uh, and then it just, it just boomed. So now we have, you know, we have a, a thousands of square feet, 75 employees, wow. three MPs, four nurse practitioners, and we literally see people from all over the world with chronic, most of them are chronic unsolved health problems. Our, our average patient has seen 13 doctors. And, um, you know, we do a lot of cancer, a lot of Lyme, uh, a lot of neurological illness, you know, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and things like that, autoimmune disease. And really we have a system where you can take this patient who's been to 13 doctors and about 85% percent of the time figure them out wow. like figure them out so that we know what's wrong with them we can handle them and they get better 
And so it's very fun. And I just every day I've got, so I've got people that come, you know, and learn and they, at the end of the day, you know, they look at me and they're like, like, this is an amazing, it's an amazing day. The people are wonderful. They're interested in their own health. They want to get better. Um, and we actually can figure them out and then they get better. And it, you know, the average patient is two to four months. They come here. Um, we don't do anything telemedicine wise. Like okay. we are really hands-on, like many people are surprised that they get a, a very detailed physical exam on their first visit. And every visit subsequently, I examine them. Um, and many doctors don't examine people now. They yeah. either are to them on a video screen or they sit across from a desk, but they don't, they don't really look at them. And so I think our success is that I'm very curious and I, I never settle for a solution, which is it's the patient's fault and they have a psychosomatic illness. Mm -hmm. Very, very rarely the case, even on people who have a lot of psychosomatic illness, most of them have underlying brain toxicities, problems, infections, that if you can get them unwound, they, they get better. They start to feel better. Mm -hmm. They're enormously grateful. And it's, um, you know, it's sort of a, my day is, is sort of one dopamine rush to another. Like some people get their dopamine because they drive fast cars yeah. and some people take drugs and some people play the, the futures market. Yeah. If you want to have a dopamine rush, you just figure out how you can help people. Yeah. And, and it's a rush. Like they come in and they, and they, they just like, you found what was wrong with me and I feel better. And I can't believe it. And I'm so glad I found you. And, and it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's just amazing. And so, you know, it's not a hard job. There's a lot of thinking that goes into it and there's a lot of problem solving and, um, and there's always learning. I mean, I'm spending, you know, probably 50 hours a week in the clinic, but then, you know, another at least 20 hours a week, just learning. You know, I listen to podcasts and I go to meetings and I read and I, you know, because sometimes you find someone and like, I'm not sure what's going on with them. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. But, you know, there's something wrong and there, there is a reason, you know, like, like there's no accidents, really. There is a, there is cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. And if your viewpoint is that and you're curious, then you can find it out. And one of the things I was going to talk about Lyme, because this is new, um, we started seeing a lot of long haul COVID patients. So these are patients, 20% of people who either had the virus, mm -hmm. got the vaccine. Yeah. Within weeks to months, will have a chronic, relentless illness, which can include any organ system that basically ruins their life. It can be neurological, it can be cardiac, it can be pulmonary, but it ruins their life. And so we are seeing a lot of these patients and I've gotten hooked up with some doctors internationally. And um, what we found with these patients is that, and then I, what, I, what happened is, is that I found that the, there was a Lyme carryover, but I didn't know it and I didn't recognize it. But if one of the things that we always do with people is we prick their finger on the first visit and we look at their blood under a microscope and we look and see what the characteristics of their blood are. Yeah. You know, are their blood cells all congested together? Do they have biofilms? Do they have, you know, inflammatory markers? And one of the things that I hadn't appreciated until just the last few months is that the, you know, one of the things you hear about these chronic COVID patients is that they get microclots. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And, you know, there's even been some stories of guys and morticians who are trying to embalm these patients after they pass away. And the embalming fluid will not go through the blood vessels. Oh, you're kidding. Because there's microclots and these microclots block the end organ. So if it's kidney or if it's brain or if it's heart or if it's pulmonary, then you get symptoms associated with that organ because you're not perfusing oxygen. You're not delivering nutrients. You're not getting rid of waste. And then that organ is in a chronic low oxygen state and it doesn't behave right. It, it doesn't do its thing right. Mm 
And so one of the underlying causes of this with these microclots is that they have platelets. So platelets are one of the cell lines that's in blood. A healthy platelet is supposed to be smaller than a red blood cell. So when you look at the blood and you see red blood cells, the platelets should all be small enough that they'd fit inside. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we're finding is that these platelets are clumping and they look gigantic. Oh, you're kidding. No. And this is a big part of what's wrong and why they have this chronic condition. And if you can get their microclots busted up, and sometimes it takes actually pharmaceutical antiplatelet drugs hmm. for four weeks or six weeks to get them busted up, then their symptoms start going away. And I saw a patient today who she lives in Mexico and I've treated her for a couple of years. She had just devastating Lyme for years and years and now she's up and functioning and she's got a family and she's actually doing quite well she is not a hundred percent there and i looked at her blood today and there they were these gigantic platelets which i hadn't known about before and so i didn't see them before and i said oh boy now i know what the last 10 percent of you know to get you better is going to involve we've got to handle this coagulopathy this problem with blood coagulation and if we can get your blood circulating properly then you, you, you will actually be fine. Mm -hmm. That's a, so anyway, this is one of these adventures that you get into this field where the problem is very complex, but there's lo lots of smart people looking yeah. and communicating with each other. Yeah. Well, and, um, yeah, the, the, the last two years must've been fascinating for you being a guy who wasn't in the infectious diseases uh, space for so long. I mean, I'm sure you sat there looking on from the sidelines going, oh, geez, dear. <laughs> it's been a bit of a mess out there. So so for the coagulation, I know that a lot of people, like I just, I'm actually three weeks out from my first ever, you know, tussle with the bad virus. Um, and, um, and one of the things I've been doing for a number of reasons, I've been using uh, proteolytic enzymes kind of on an empty stomach figuring i kind of envision proteolytic enzymes as little pac-men from that old little video game kind of right. running around chewing up things that don't belong is that is that i mean for someone who's not terribly sick is that it's, something that that can be helpful just in terms of cleaning up the the debris after an event like that i mean we don't really know why it's happening i mean maybe you do but th there's a lot of theories out there yeah oh for sure Oh, for sure. And, um, you know, proteolytic enzymes are used in lots of things, but, you know, if the person could tolerate high-ish doses of it, you mm -hmm. need high doses of it. Okay. Because they're, uh, and they're, they're good. And if your stomach can tolerate it, um, it's, um, yeah, I think it's a great thing to do and it's the right, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, so we normally were using them. What I didn't appreciate is that sometimes you really have to either very push the dose, or like I said, you have to use pharmaceuticals for a while to get this thing to like bust up. Okay. And once you get it to bust up, it stays busted. Like the, like, why are the platelets glomming together like that? Do you know, or is it just well, an artifact protein. of something? Yeah. In COVID spike protein is a very pro-inflammatory thing. And when your white blood cells ingest the spike proteins, it turns them into a, a massive cytokine interferon, uh, TNF alpha, you know, these, all these high inflammatory particles, it turns them on to that. And then they're circulating around in the bloodstream. And then the inside of the blood vessels get inflamed. Uh, and so you have this sort of cascade and the platelets get mixed up in this whole thing. It's probably mm -hmm. not only platelets, but yeah. platelets seem to be a very important part of it. So that then if you can use things like Ibu, where we do blood filtration, you know, you can start filtering this stuff out and you see the blood come out of the body and it's all sludgy. You know, it's all sludgy. You can see it in the, in the, in the tube. And then it goes through the dialysis machine and it filters out the, the sludge, so to speak. And then it comes back looking clean. And sometimes you know, halfway through an hour treatment, the patient will say, oh, my brain cleared, my brain wow. cleared. Wow, wow. So when you say Ibu, you're talking about the ozone, is that the ozone treatment? Well, it's ozone, but it's ozone where the blood actually gets filtered through a dialysis machine. Oh, no kidding, okay. So the blood comes out one arm, it goes through a dialysis machine, 
Ozone is then added to it and it goes back into the body. And so the blood is circulated for an hour through this ozone machine. So you circulate the blood many times and the filter catches all this debris. And then the blood is relatively, you know, cleaner. And now the circulation and these platelet mixtures, I think get stuck in there too. And then you get a, you know, you get a, an overall way better situation. Yeah, no uh, kidding. So the organs can be perfused. I think that's why the brain turns on like, like now blood is getting to these little yeah. teeny capillaries in the brain and the brain starts working. Yeah. It's like somebody turned literally like someone turned the lights on. So, the and so once you've done this, let's say you do a 10 pass, whatever number of passes you're going to do with the blood, is it a one-time thing or does the patient need to come back and repeat it? Like, is there like, I can't imagine that every, all the negatives, like all the bad stuff is sitting in the blood. Does it kind of hide out in the organs and at a tissue level? And then you kind of have to repeat the process maybe in a couple of weeks or a month later, or is it that once you've cleaned it out, it's done? No, no, you do it. We do it weekly, you know, and sometimes people clear in four weeks and some people clear in eight weeks, you know, it's all, you know, it's very, each patient is a little bit different. Right. So, you know, you add that with hyperbaric oxygen because you can hyper oxygenate the body. So they sit in a chamber breathing 100% oxygen with uh, one and a half atmospheres of pressure and you force oxygen in these organs. And this is another part of this thing that helps people because if you can deliver oxygen, then mm -hmm. they can, you know, tissue start to perform right. Yeah. So, yeah. So this process involves that kind of thing. Um, and then in Lyme disease, you know, Lyme disease patients, when you look at their blood, you can see there's biofilms in their blood. There's collections of bacteria that have surrounded themselves with a sort of a mucus protein so that the immune system doesn't see them. They may not test positive for Lyme because the stuff's all locked up. It's and cloaked. It yeah. doesn't, even, doesn't even see it. And you've got to get that stuff opened up. And, um, you know, I used to be an infectious disease doctor and I use antibiotics if I need to, if someone's got a high fever and pneumonia, well, I'll give them the antibiotics. Yeah. Uh, people with chronic Lyme, antibiotics doesn't do them any good. In fact, it usually does them bad. So we never, virtually never use antibiotics. We might use antifungal sometimes, we might use antiparasitic sometimes, but virtually never antibiotics because they, they just don't work. And there's some doctors who are, you know, they help people on five antibiotics for years. And, God. Or, or, you know, they don't get better because it's, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't do it. You can't get the antibiotics delivered to where the bacteria are to actually get them killed. Yeah. So that it's, you know, if you go to Lyme meetings, it's, 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 it's mostly antibiotics. Yeah. Well, biofilm is, is a big deal. So what is it that are you using pharmaceuticals to bust up the biofilm? Or I know that there's some, some herbals that, that break up biofilm are they strong enough or do you have to actually you know, go? Ozone's a really good biofilm buster. It is, huh? Yeah, it's really good. So you do IV ozone and, and it's, um, it's really good. And almost everybody, you start, start them and, you know, 15 or 20 treatments later, you look at their blood again and the biofilms are, it's hard to find them. Wow. And the inflammatory stuff comes way down. And then, you know, they start to feel better. Their body starts to come back into sync with it. And so do you think that for the person who's not chronically ill, would there be a place for doing these some of some degree of this type of treatment, like maybe not as intensively as you're doing with a chronically ill patient, but as a preventative, like I would imagine that most of us walking around have have sludge in our blood, maybe not to the degree that it's that it's blocking microcirculation and, and depriving organs of of blood but maybe a, 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 to a small degree like do you think that doing these types of treatments if someone can can get access to them even once a month or once every couple of weeks well maybe once a month just on a maintenance level <laughs> kind of thing a a absolutely absolutely the, the, the when you said most of us i would say all of us yeah no i'm I'm, I'm trying to be nice but yeah <laughs> No, anybody who thinks that they don't that they're not full of bad stuff is just delusional yeah. i mean i worked with you know almost all i do is chronic illness but i'm i'm a triathlete and i've done you know 43 iron man triathlons and i get you wow. know and, and my company <laughs> my my nutrition company 
there's a lot of athletes that are that that like these products because they're performance products. Oh yeah. So they come and they want consultations. And I've worked with some of the best Olympic runners and cyclists and hockey players and football players in the world. And you know, they're they're functioning at a very, very high end. But if you do the same sort of analysis on them, and what they've got to do is they've got to be able to squeeze out 10 more watts of power on a bike and they can win the Tour de France. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, a hundredth of a second in a hundred yard freestyle and they can be an Olympic champion. And so these are the things that impair them too. Yeah. Being just a little bit better because their selenium is too low or they need some zinc or, you know, they have some biofilms or they have parasites in their gut and you, you, so we do the same analysis on them as we do on all the sick people and you find stuff. And then you put people through these programs where you can kind of unburden them and replace their deficiencies and get their gut working better. And then they get, they get better too. You know, they get, they get, you know, they, 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 their, their body performance goes up, even though they were functioning at a high level. Yeah. They could be better. So it's the, the, the model works, you know, no matter where you, you know, no matter who you try it on. Mm-hmm. You know, you get the woman that can't get pregnant. Okay. Like she's tried and tried and she can't get pregnant. And then you bring her in and you put her through this program and you optimize her hormones and her thyroid and her gut. And next thing you know, she's pregnant because these are the things that are wrong with human bodies or that go wrong with human bodies that have to be fixed in order for you to have physiology that works Mm -hmm. and physiology that works is what health is. Yeah. And that's energy and vitality and, you know, and, and no pain and, and having a fun, you know, fun time working. So, um, well, yeah. and, 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 you know, I think this is at the root of anti-aging longevity and health span, like those three buzzwords everybody's talking about now that's saying, yeah, okay. We kind of seem to be able to keep people alive a really long time, but it turns out that just keeping someone alive, isn't all that great. <laughs> if- if they're going to be, you know, in pain in like my, my next door neighbor who just passed away was 97 years old. She was in a zero gravity wheelchair. She was in ridiculous amounts of pain. Um, and yet her, her mind, she was all there, right? She was super sharp and, um, nobody wants that. Like that's, that's just not, that's not the goal. And so now all of a sudden everybody's like, yeah, I want to live a long time. And also (laughs) I want to be able to go hiking and I want to remember everybody's name around me. And I want to be, have joy and, and, and love my life until the day that I'm not here. Kind of thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's never been more challenging than now. Yeah. You know, the opportunity now is because there's, there's all this new technology uh, you know, peptides and diagnostic stuff. But then on the other hand, we have an environment that's very, that's very tough on everyone. And, um, and yeah, that's what, that's what smart people want. Yeah. Uh, And so what are your thoughts on, I mean, I'm going to go completely, I'm going to start jumping around here because, you know, I, I think there's so much we could talk about, but what are your thoughts on things like non-native EMFs and 5G and that impact on people? Do you, are you finding that, Like, is your opinion in terms of your practice and what you've seen that this is a real issue for people or is it more of an issue for people who already have an overburdened system or maybe some people are more sensitive than others? Do you, what are your thoughts on that? Because I think, you know, if we believe that this has a negative impact on the human system, it is, I mean, you can't get away from it. You'd be, it's, it's, I mean, I went camping a couple summers ago in like one of the largest national parks in in the world and i still had cell phone reception (laughs) you know which was really depressing because i had told everybody i'm unreachable and i still pretended i couldn't use my cell phone but but you know i went to take a picture at one point and i'm like oh my god like i actually i could get reception if i really wanted to here right right so i just had an interesting personal experience because we had a guy come to our house and analyze it for electronic frequencies okay and um so I'm, I'm laying on my bed and he's got a meter that if you put the electrode in your hand, he can measure the standing wave voltage that's in your body. Okay. Just ambient electrical fields that are around your, in our bedroom. Now we have no electronics in the bedroom. 
okay? There's no TV sets, there's no cell phones, there's no electric clocks, there's no electronics in the bedroom at all, okay? okay. I'm, laying, I'm laying on my bed uh, and a healthy level is 0 0.015 millivolts on a resting body, okay? And mine was 1.4. So it's a th almost a thousand times too high. Wow. Now, I'm holding the electrode and he says to me, take your hand and reach up above your head so your hand is against the wall where your headboard is. So the, the headboard is like this high and I reach back and we're watching the meter and it goes from 1.4 to 18. Wow. Okay, so that's 18,000 millivolts. Mm -hmm. Should be one millivolts. So now we had installed in our bedroom a switch which would turn off all the electrical currents in the master bedroom and master bath. We put it in a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. We're very lazy about using it because if you walk in the bathroom in the middle of the night with no light or no <laughs> anything, you can't see. <laughs> Funny how that works. <laughs> and we just didn't want to confront it. And so we just didn't use it. Okay. So uh -huh. I'm hanging in the bed and he says to me, and he puts the switch in my hand, which it's an elect, it's a switch, which you push it. And then it goes to the circuit breaker and it breaks all the electrical circuits that are in the bedroom. And he turns, I turn the switch and it goes clink. And I feel it. I feel it. I feel my body just go like, oh God. And I look at the meter and it's 0 0.03. Wow. Went from 18 to 0 0.03. And I can feel it. And I'm like, oh my God. You know, we have a bed. There's no springs in it. You know, it's a, you know, it's, I've done all the stuff. Yeah. I didn't, it hit me like, man, this stuff is really bad. Yeah. So from now on, so we figured out how to see in the middle of the night, if you got to get up and go to the bathroom. <laughs> and every night we've been turning off the electrical switch and I have an aura ring. So I track my sleep. I'm getting an hour more of deep sleep every night with that one change. Yeah. Well, it's a big so, one. It's huge. Yeah. Well, it's, and, it's, it's eight and your HRV must be off the charts. My HRV is pretty good, but yeah. this is, this is, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's a, these are, these are, these are things that they hit everybody. Yeah. So you know, I, I, it's, 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 and I'm not, I don't suffer from lack of energy and I'm, you know, I'm yeah. still racing triathlons and I, you know, I work out uh, hard and I, you know, and I, for all intents and purposes, I, I like had no complaints, but this is, this is a game changer. It's one simple thing. Turn off the, turn off the electronics in your bedroom before you go to bed at night. Yeah. And don't have any electronics in your bedroom. And I knew this, but the, the, the experience of it was just like. Holy. But I think part of what you're saying also, it's not just the electronics in the bedroom. It's the wiring in the walls that's going to the plugs. That's still like, you know, yes. there's still current there. Like there's still. That's exactly right. There's still current. Any, any devices in the room. Yeah, because just because you're not using it doesn't mean it's not there. And I think, who is it that talks about it? I think they talk about dirty electricity, which is like a whole other issue around that. And so I would imagine that if you, Mr. Triathlete, healthy guy, can feel it, then for someone who's, who's over, whose system is overburdened, it must be just yet another assault on the system. Absolutely. Because, you know, all the little, all the little connections in the body are, are microcurrent levels, you know, 70 millivolt, you know, as a sodium moves across and a calcium moves in and a potassium moves out, these little pumps, they're electronic pumps and they're the mic, it's micro voltage, but mm -hmm. you put them in a field where you've got, you know, you've got 1.4 milli, you know, 1.4 volts, not yeah. milli volts, thousand times in an environment where constantly this thing's being bar barraged, literally. Um, it's going to have an effect on the system. If the, you know, it's a stressor. It's a real stressor. And so, especially at night when you want to be parasympathetic and you're in bed, but you're, you're basically still sympathetic because the body's trying to deal with this noise, so to speak, yeah. uh, where its own internal flows are being affected. It's, it's, it's an important thing.
Yeah, no kidding. It's funny, I um, when you talk about the noise, I just recently got a pair of um, noise canceling headphones, which I, I hadn't had before. And I was on a flight and, you know, I've never, never really thought about the noise on a plane, but I put my noise canceling headphones on my head because I was going to do um, a new comm session because I'd had to get up really early in the morning. And I just thought, you know, I need to recover. When I put those things on my ears, it was like, I didn't realize that I was, it was like being in a stadium filled with screaming people. <laughs> like the noise on a plane, um, the ambient noise, never mind, you know, screaming babies or whatnot, but just the, the, the ambient noise and how that would affect your system on top of everything else that you're dealing with on the plane, it blew me away. I like, okay. I'm like, I am never going anywhere without these things. And even if I'm not listening to anything, I just have them on to black block out the sound. Right. Right. Of course, I don't have them on Bluetooth. I have them hardwired to my phone. <laughs> you know? I mean, if it's not one thing, it's another. So, so you mentioned chelation earlier. So maybe talk a little bit like where in terms of uh, heavy metals, because this also contributes, it contributes to the Lyme patient, but it contributes to the patient with neurodegenerative issues and with um, autoimmune issues. Like how are you measuring people's heavy metal loads? Like people argue a lot about, you know, it's hair tissue mineral analysis or it's a blood draw. What, what are you finding are the best ways to assess people's and it's really about the balance, right? I mean, A, there's toxicity, obviously, of mercury, lead, the the ones you don't want any of in your system. But then there's even kind of imbalances that that, as you had said earlier, like, you know, we're we're electrical beings. And that means we need certain balance of different minerals that are kind of like these spark plugs in the body. And if you have too much one and not enough of the other, again, it's it's gonna impair the body's ability to work properly. Yeah, well, I mean, there is no good way to assess total body load of, you know, arsenic, mercury, aluminum, cadmium, all those things. There's no, there isn't any way. Um, even if you do tissue biopsies, you know, the liver may have a lot and the heart may have a lot and the brain may not have as much. So there isn't any good way. So all of them are guesstimates. Okay. And some people can, you know, sometimes hair is helpful, sometimes it's not. Um, and, you know, you can do challenges where you give people a chelator and then you have them pee out urine and you find some. The, the bottom line is that we're all heavy metal toxic. Mm -hmm. The planet is, you know, the, the, if you look at a, and this was actually done, you, you can, you can um, measure lead level in bone by x-ray diffraction. And so what they did is they took some, some bones from some Native Americans from like the 1500s and they did x-rays of the bones to measure what the lead level was and then they took people just walking on the street in new york city and they did it they brought them in and they mm -hmm. said would you be part of the study and they just did an x-ray of their wrist to see what the lead level was in their wrist based on the same technique and the amount of lead in our bones now compared to 500 years ago is about 600 times the amount wow Wow. And that's from leaded gasoline. So mm -hmm. leaded gasoline was used when the first cars, 1910, somewhere in there, till about 1960, when they figured out that these, this, this leaded gasoline was leaving lead in the atmosphere. And yeah, it was vaporizing. It, yeah. And it was putting it in the soil. And so all the topsoil is lead contaminated. And I don't care if you're organic or not, you, there's lead in all the food and you're getting lead. Yeah. And now a lot of the chemical pesticides have arsenic and they have cadmium. And then people are using products that have aluminum and, um, you know, as deodorants and they're cooking with aluminum and they're storing food, food aluminum and uh, mercury, you know, fish are full of mercury and coal burning plants produce mercury. So like we're all inundated and everybody's heavy metal toxic. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I, I find that the, the, we usually do an objective test for heavy metals where we, we give them a challenge or there's another, one of the labs we use gives actual blood levels of uh, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, aluminum, and lead. And, um, and people have high blood levels. They're just walking around. These are, these are circulating levels of these, these heavy metals uh, that are in their blood and they're, they're not supposed to be there. No. They, um, 
you know, at a, you, you, you have to be careful when you detox heavy metals in people because if they're mineral deficient and hormone deficient and they have a bad gut and their liver is totally overloaded, you can hurt them if you try to chelate them yeah. because it, the liver won't process the, you know, it won't take it out. Mm-hmm. And so the chelators will, I had, I had a lady, she was a, she was the top real estate broker in the area. And she went to a doctor. So she's very bright. She's very professional. She's very successful, you know, and she's in her mid fifties. She's at the top of her career and she was feeling a little bit fatigued. And she went to a doctor in town where I am and he did a heavy metal challenge on her. And she found that she had lead and he started a chelation program on her. So he was giving her IV chelation twice a week. And he didn't pay enough attention to these other things, her gut, her minerals, her hormones, these other things. Her liver was already overloaded. Mm. The EDTA, which was the chelator, started pulling lead out of the bones because that's where lead mostly sits in most of us because it's like calcium and it will sit where calcium sits. And the lead got pulled out of the bones. It went to the liver and the liver was basically, I can't take anymore. Yeah. It didn't go through the liver and it got deposited in her brain. And she literally became a bag lady. Now she walked around with grandma dresses, carrying paper, you know, shopping paper bags. And she wore earphones and played religious music on a cassette deck. Come on. I'm not kidding you. And she was basically ruined. And her daughter brought her into us. And it took me about two years of very carefully working with her to where we actually got the brain levels of lead down to where her brain could start to function. And she became way more normal. She never got back to the way she was originally, Hmm. Uh, but she was much, you know, she could function. So these, so you got to watch this, you know, doctors that, you know, some of these medicines are very powerful and you got to make sure that you're sequencing things just right. Because if you're not, you can hurt people. Yeah. Yeah. You're trying to do the right thing, but you can, you can do what happened to this lady. And it, it's um, so, so everybody's got this stuff and um, you know, you try the best you can to avoid it, you know, like um, don't use aluminum pots and pans and don't use yeah. deodorant with aluminum and these sort of common sense things. Don't take your Chinese takeout food and aluminum pan where they put boiling hot noodles and yes. all the rest of well, or barbecue, or do you do that thing where people barbecue in tinfoil? Barbecue, uh, I, wrap food in tinfoil. Yeah. Real food in tinfoil. The food, the tinfoil is getting in the food. It's in the food. The aluminum is in the food. I, I, I think I have a roll of tinfoil that's about 15 years old. Like, I just don't use the stuff. <laughs> like, I'll use it in the bottom of a pan when the food's on top on a, uh-huh. on a gray. And even then, rarely, just because I'm feeling lazy and I know I don't want to clean the bottom. But... Um, but yeah, it, it, it is, it's funny to me, you know, that how, like, it seems to me almost like common sense, like people, nobody should be cooking in aluminum anymore. Nobody should be using an aluminum foil. And yet it's not, it's still not common knowledge. Like people still don't, aren't aware somehow. Right. Well, and I, I think what's happened is that, that the population in general has been so sort of numbed on one side and brainwashed on the other side that most of the habits of most people are not very good. Mm-hmm. They eat lunch at McDonald's and they, you know, they buy boxed foods and, you know, they just, you know, if they thought about it or it was a priority or they you know, listen to something like this and they thought about it, that they would, it would make total sense to them. But the barrage of Madison Avenue and brainwashing is so pervasive that it's almost inescapable. And, um, you know, you drive by the McDonald's and you're hungry and you think, well, maybe that there's chili isn't so bad, you know, like what could be bad? Yeah, Except, I'll ha- or I'll have the chicken. Chicken's good. <laughs> um, chicken's good. And it's, yeah. it's chicken that's been hormoned up to death and antibiotic and the cheapest level that you could possibly get. And, you know, it's just like, no, it's, it's not food. It's, it's poison. 
Yeah. And if you want to live long and feel good, you can't, you got to stop poisoning yourself as much as you can. Even if you're really good at it, you're still going to get a lot. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Well, exactly, right? Even even living a relatively clean lifestyle, as you said before, like it, it's out there and it's in us, whether, and to some degree, you know, I think what's interesting talking to a guy like you is it really drives home the fact that, well, if you are one of these people that has one of these chronic illnesses and your body's overburdened, like they know, they know they're in trouble. They know they need to do something. Yeah. The rest of us who feel fairly optimized, yeah. it's, it's, it just hasn't hit our threshold of tolerance yet. So we right. just don't want, and we just don't know it. And if you wait to hit the threshold of tolerance, it's a whole lot harder to fix than if you can just always just keep it down. Yeah. Yeah. We measure glyphosate levels on every person that we see. Okay. I've done thousands of tests on glyphosate. So it's a urine, it's a random urine. You just get up in the morning, you pee in the cup, you bring the sample in, we send it to the lab, they measure glyphosate levels. I've never had a zero, ever. No. Everyone has glyphosate, just like everyone has lead. Yeah. And people, I'm eating organic, you know, I'm being really careful. But uh, they live on a, they live in a community where there can't be any weeds in that community. You know, it's a gated yeah. community. It's a nice, you know, it's a nice place to live. And it's all manicured and it's beautiful. But that glyphosate is getting sprayed every day. Yeah. And or they play yeah, golf. <laughs> well, they golf, yeah. Golf course ones are even the worst. Yeah. So they get it and it's, it poisons them. So it's, it's, you know, you really have to, it's hard. Yeah. <sighs> So what, so what should people do? So let's say, you know, so, so the person who's sick, as we said, knows that they're sick, they know they need help. They should probably get on a plane, go to Clearwater, come to your place and, and, you know, spend a couple of months kind of getting to the bottom of, of whatever's going on with them. But for people who are walking around and who are fine, they're okay. Right. They're not, they're not particularly sick. I mean, they're, they feel pretty good. Yep. They're doing their best. But then what should this person, what should these people, like, what would you recommend to these people that they kind of do on a maintenance level to say to D and, and I think probably the best expression is to deburden the body, like to reduce that load. Maybe you can never get it down to zero, but you know, is there kind of like, um, an order of operations that, you know, maybe do Ibo, Ibu like a couple of times a year, maybe we do, um, hyperbaric a certain couple times a year? Are there like, what's, what do people need to do? What should people be thinking of doing to kind of keep that, keep that Delta, if you will, yeah, as wide as possible? Well, I think the first thing is like, is, is sort of ground zero is eat organic at least 80% of the time. Don't yeah. go out much. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, I push people at first toward sort of an autoimmune paleo diet. So meat, fish, eggs, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, no packaged foods, okay? It all has to be fresh and yeah. organic, okay? No legumes, no nightshade vegetables, no dairy, no grains. This is a starting point. Now, some people can eat those foods, but for most people as a starting point, in six weeks, they're, they will feel completely different. And that's like a no brainer and anybody can do that. Yep. And, um, and so, uh, you have to have a bowel movement every day. Okay. Your habits been every other day, every third day, once a week. No, every day you have to have a bowel movement. And if you need to take some magnesium or you need to take some herbs, or you need to take some fiber, but you have to have a bowel movement every day. You have to have fresh, clean water that you drink. I find the easiest way is just get reverse osmosis water. Yeah. Put a filter on your shower because the chlorine. water systems have chlorine and chloramines and glyphosate and statins from your next door neighbor mm. that he eat out. And it's a way to just protect yourself a little bit. So those are like givens. The third thing is you have to ensure that you're getting adequate sleep. Okay. It's like holy in our house. So I've been married for 53 years. Okay. We have an agreement lights are out at 10 o'clock and no controversial subjects after seven. Nice. <laughs> nice. No news watching. No, <laughs> none of it. Yeah. yeah. And, no, and no electronics a couple hours before bed. 
Mm-hmm. You know, don't sit in bed and look at your, at your Instagram. It screams, don't, don't do it. You know, I have a hard book. I go to bed at 930 and I read a regular book. Um, and that relaxes me or I do a crossword puzzle, something like that. And that relaxes me. And, and so these things are, are like real important. If you're really into it, get some blue blocker glasses. And when the sun goes down, put them on so that your, your blue light exposure is reduced. Okay. So sleep and everybody needs at least seven hours of sleep. And some people need nine Mm -hmm. and I would get, I'd spend 500 bucks and buy an aura ring, or if you have a Fitbit or a Garmin watch or something where you can track your sleep is start tracking your sleep so that you get adequate amounts of deep sleep and REM sleep so that you know you start and it's just a training thing for most people you have to train yourself to to I always slept between five and five hours a night and five hours and 15 minutes a night always because I was on call a lot I was working and I had a family and I was training for triathlons and I just and then when I three years ago I was one of the first guys to get an aura ring and I looked at my at my scores for the for sleep and you know good is above 80 and and real goods above 85 and I'm running 50. Yeah no kidding with five hours well aura wouldn't like that. No. <laughs> my it's aura just, would be it, like bonking me on the head going what are you doing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and so yeah. what I figured out is I need seven hours of sleep so lights are out of 10 I get up usually quarter to five so, and then I can get scores. My score this morning was 89. Yeah. So I had, you know, good amounts of deep sleep and good amounts of REM sleep. And that's, it's a requirement because you can't be healthy without sleep. Okay. If you have sleep apnea, if you snore, sometimes you have to work people up for this is like, Hey, you got to figure out some solution to your sleep because you're getting hypoxic all yeah. night and you're not sleeping and you're in a stress mode all night. So that's super important. The other pillar of this thing is you got to move. Okay. Mm-hmm. You got to move your body around. The thing which correlates with longevity or the two things which correlate with the most with longevity is lung function. And the way you get your lung function up is you make yourself do things where you breathe hard and you work to breathe and you've got to keep your muscles. So you got to lift three things, you know, three times a week. I don't care if you do weights or you do pull-ups or you do floor exercises or you do pulleys or you do stretch cords or you do X3, whatever. Because as you get older, it's very hard to maintain your strength. And as your muscle goes, your health is going to go. Your frailty, a person who falls down and breaks their hip has a 50% chance of being dead within one year from wow. just a hip fracture. Okay, yeah. It's yeah. devastating to the body. So these are things that are like super, super important. They can't be ignored by anyone. Okay? Mm-hmm. And then the next one is the food isn't good enough. And people need supplementation. Okay. So I'm um, toot our horn now. We have body health. We have a multivitamin, which is really good. It's the best multivitamin for your money that you can get. It's only two tablets in the morning, two tablets at night. But it has in it, it's a 16 whole food organic concentrate. So you're getting real food with it. Mm -hmm. It's boosting vitamin C and CoQ10 and activated folic acid and K2 and 5,000 units of vitamin D. So like it's really got a lot of stuff in it that you'd have to buy five other products for to, to, to get the same stuff, okay? Yeah. Everybody needs some kind of an omega-3 oil, krill, mm-hmm. fish oil, something, because virtually everybody's deficient in that. Everybody needs amino acids. Yes. Okay? I've measured thousands of people on their serum amino acids and they're low. They don't eat enough protein. They don't digest the protein and they need amino acids. So perfect amino is the best amino acid in the world. And people should take two scoops or 10 tablets every day. And it helps you maintain your normal body protein levels. These are like, everybody has to do this. Almost everybody we test is deficient in iodine and magnesium. So these are supplements that you need and most people need a probiotic. So these are like- My Lugos. (laughs) So these are, these are things that, that you can just start this stuff, you know, yeah. you this is just foundation for sure. And if you do this for a lot of people, it'll change your life. Mm-hmm. It'll change your life. If you're smoking, stop smoking. You know, that's the other sort of dumb thing. Yeah. But, um, and, uh, and, and drinking then, and drinking, like there's one, there's not one benefit to alcohol. Except no. it makes you sick and it kills your liver and it kills your brain. And there's already enough things that are trying to do in your life. So why why add to the why add to it? It's right. just like 
you know? Yeah, no, this is great. So this is like the, the basics, but now let's say somebody says, okay, I've got that, those boxes checked. Should I be doing an ozone? Should I be treating my blood with ozone once or twice a year, let's say, just to clean my blood? Like, is that something that you would, you would say for the person who's got the means and the wherewithal to, to kind of do that kind of stuff? Or do you think well, it's overkill? Uh, no, it's not overkill at all. What they should do is then they should go to a, they should go to somebody. It could be a naturopath or a chiropractor or a medical doctor or, or a nutritional counselor is experienced and they should get a, a full physical ex- evaluation and they should get a broad lab evaluation to yeah. see where are the glitches in my system. So I'm doing all the right habits, but you may be sitting on yeast in your intestine or some parasites or a nutritional deficiency that that they can help you figure that out. And then often that goes along with, um, ozone is like the, the antidote to about everything. Mm-hmm. So whatever you got, ozone helps. And um, so there's ozone and there's Myers cocktails and there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff, pulse magnetic field and hyperbaric oxygen. And if you wanna optimize, then you get with a practitioner who's got these things and they can, they can be your coach to optimize you so that you are the best that you can be at the age you're at. And then you, your, you know, longevity comes with that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, 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 I love that. So, and we talked a little bit about the protein and one of the things I know with the essential amino acids that I think is, you know, I love that you said everybody baseline two scoops a day. And then if you're an athlete or if you're injured or you've had surgery or your digestion shot, it's going to go up from there. Yeah. Like yeah. that's, that's kind of the baseline, keep the lights on. And then yeah. any further demands, um, I think that- You're pregnant, you're nursing, you have osteoporosis, you just had surgery. Man, you're, you're a triathlete or you're a marathon runner or you do CrossFit really hard. You need more. Yeah. You need more. You know, it's interesting. People get this idea that it's a, what you need is protein, but what you need is essential amino acids. There yeah. isn't a protein requirement of the body. There's an essential amino acid requirement of the body. And for most people, they need double what the minimum daily requirement of protein is. Minimum. And almost nobody gets it. That's why you have to substitute with amino acids because you're not, you're not getting enough. You know? yeah. You're not going to eat a pound and a half of hamburger every day to meet your daily requirements of, of essential amino acids through through dietary intake. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, so these, these are things that are, they're, they're very simple. And they're things that people who are walking around and want to feel better, if they just do this stuff, it'll, it, 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 they'll be great. And then if you add peptides to that and you add hormones to that and you add, you know, more optimizers, methylene blue to that, you know, there's a, there's like a million hacks going on right now, but you got to fill in the foundation first or, yeah. or you're wasting your money and your time. So if you go to a health practitioner, you expect them to fix you. You know, what I would do is to schedule the appointment for three months and get all these things in right away. And then when you go there, you will feel a million times better. You'll even maybe wonder why you're even going. Mm-hmm. And then if you're a practitioner, they will find some more little things, which will just like put the cherry on top of the cake. And, um, and then you really, you know, then you can survive this environment. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, that's that's such a good point. So, are you um, are you using? And I don't know if you want to talk about this particularly, but you mentioned peptides a couple of times. And yeah. so, are you um, are you finding them helpful? I mean, I've I've heard definitely with Lyme and and a lot of the co infections, people find some of these peptides can be very helpful in mitigating their symptoms and helping them along the the recovery train. But, you know, I get a lot of, because I have this large community, people come to me and say, well, what's the peptide for this? You know, what's the peptide for Lyme? What's the peptide for, I'm like, there is no peptide. You know, there are peptides that can help you along the way, but there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done before you bring that into play. And I'm from what you're saying here. (laughs) I mean, part of my initial program is all the things I just told you. And then we will throw peptides in there. We we do a lot of peptides. Um, I take six or seven peptides myself five days a week. I mean, they're these are these are great things. They really help. Yeah. And um, you know, the older you get, the more you need them. 
so they 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 they're they're great um but they're budget you know they're pricey you mm -hmm. know most peptides are a couple hundred bucks a month per one yeah you no know? so um and the injectable ones are way better than the there's you know there's pill forms of thymus and alpha one and tb4 and and i don't know that they're any good but, but you know what it is i think they're different right i think like the thymus and alpha one that that it i I think it's called thymogen alpha one that's a pill form and it actually and it i think the the doctor who developed it it was really having lost thymus and alpha one on the market people are looking for some other way to support their immune system and yeah. what the components of that are is essentially their bioregulators which are the short chain peptides so there's vilon and thymogen in there and they're great and they are orally bioavailable but they are different in action than a thigh. They don't, they can't replace thymocin alpha one. Right. You know what I mean? Like they just don't work. They're, they're not meant to do the same thing. It's more of a over time kind of upgrade of the system. Um, it's not like thymocin alpha one, which, you know, is so hard to get, but has an acute application in certain instances when people are dealing with certain things. Right. Yeah. So, it's, I think the orals are, I, you know, I don't know. I, I think the orals can be good, but they're, but they're different. And very often they're misunderstood and people expect them to do what the, what the injectable would do. And, you know, nothing can do what the injectable does. Right. And I think the other point is, is if you're trying to do this stuff over bad habits, it won't work. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And that's where you get people saying it doesn't work. I'm like, well, it doesn't because you didn't. You know, like you have to do the work for it to do the work. Like it's kind of the way it goes. And people don't like to hear that quite often. But I would say that in the audience of people listening to this podcast, you have a lot of people like your patients that come to you who are ready to do the work. Yeah. Like these are people who have figured out that the system that is existing right now, the medical system that exists is not there. It's, it's not enough. And, and that's the nicest way I can put it. You know, it's it's not enough. It's not there to help them to optimize, or, you know, it's 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 overburdened. It's it's misguided. It's got a lot of things going on, and it's not going to fix you. And that well, that and even even more than that, if you get into that system, there's a good chance it'll hurt you. Yeah, yeah. No, we talk to those people every day and I'm sure you see, well, like you said, they've seen 13 doctors by the time they come to you and they didn't get, they most, for the most part, they didn't get 13 steps closer to, to better. They're just, you know, and I had a woman say to me today that, you know, she's got a crazy condition and at the end of the day, she's found something that helps her and it is a peptide. Um, but it, nobody would think of it for her condition. And when she sees the specialist, they don't believe her. And they, and, and, and when I'm, and I'm like sitting there going, well, what do you mean they don't believe you? She goes, no, they think that it, it was just that any benefit I'm getting is probably just a coincidence, but they have nothing for her. She tells them about this stuff and you would think, and I think this is one of the big tragedies is the loss of curiosity. Yeah. When, when medical doctors who ultimately need to be the Sherlock Holmes of the planet, really, like you guys are like, you, you, you are like playing with a Rubik's cube every single day of your life. You're sitting right. there trying to figure out how did the pieces and know that every cube is different. And I think what's sad is, is a, you know, whether it's been crushed out of them by the system or by med school, or they just were not naturally curious, which I don't really believe. I think most people start out in life pretty curious. And if you're going to med school, You've got to have some curiosity, yeah. but they stop being, they stop being open and curious about new things. And so here she's got something that might actually be a really interesting tool in a, in a, in an almost insurmountable problem. And she's right. getting shut down at every turn. Right. Right. So the systems become very authoritarian and nobody's interested in answers. People are interested in dictation and, you know, force. So yeah. you see it, you see it across the board. And most doctors, if they don't know about it, they don't like it. They yeah. You know, if the rep, if the, if the rep didn't tell them about it, they, they're not interested. 
which is the, it, like you said, it's, a, it's an incredible, incredible tragedy. Because, you know, the United States, I don't know what, where Canada's at, is, you know, 29th on the longevity list of countries. It's, it's the sickest country and one of the sickest countries in the world. It's certainly the sickest industrialized country in the world that spends more on healthcare than practically all the rest of the world put together and has the worst health outcomes. Yeah. Because the, because the, the, the people who are directing medicine and directing budgets and money and authority and as are there, they're, you know, it's a, it's a, it's the wrong way and it's not working. Yeah. And so we have epidemics of cancer and autism and, you know, osteoporosis and diabetes, and obesity, and, and, um, and, and they're just pretending like it's not happening. Yeah. So, um, well, and these are solvable problems, you know, and I think that anyway, I think I look, we're definitely on the same page. And like I said, I think the good news is that a lot of people, as much as there are people still sleeping at the wheel, there are a lot of people um, in the in there are a lot of people who believe that it doesn't have to be this way. And yeah. to your point, you well, just want to stay you, you want to stay out of that system. You know? Listen, I got my um, I got an appointment. I got. I'm losing you. Can you hear me? Hang on just a sec. OK. So after having brought that state of the nation, the good news is that there's a lot that everybody can do to empower themselves and to feel better. And if you are someone with one of these chronic conditions, then at the end of the day, it's about finding the Dr. Minkoffs in the world. I don't know that there's too many of you, but there's a couple of you out there. And um, it's about finding a doctor who's curious enough to walk with you and really find the answers, for, help you to find the answers. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you for agreeing to be on the podcast. Uh, maybe you can tell people about how they can find you and contact you. And then we'll, we'll tell them about a little bit about body health as well to get those amazing supplements. Okay. So my clinic has a website. It's lifeworks, L-I-F-E-W-O-R-K-S, wellnesscenter.com. We're in Clearwater, Florida. Uh, the website has hundreds of videos and lots of information. So if you're interested, you can uh, check that out. Um, I have a nutrition company called Body Health. So it's bodyhealth.com. Uh, we make fantastic nutritional products. Again, there's hundreds of videos on there. You can go get some information. I write a couple of free newsletters. So if you go to either of those sites, you can sign up for the newsletters. Uh, we have lots of people who get them and like them. And I, you know, every week I talk about some aspect of health and how you can improve your health or interesting things I've learned or run across. So um, that's the way, to, best way to, to get me. Amazing. Thank you so much. And we do, yeah, Body Health was very generous and gave the audience a, a discount, uh, which will be in the show notes. And um, I will share that as well. So thank you so much for all that you do and for taking the time to speak with me today. And uh, I hope that we get to chat again soon. Great. Thank you. Thank you.